And as we were discussing this morning, we want to continue in our study on the new birth. This course comes primarily from the teaching of Jesus to Nicodemus in John the third chapter and verses one through eight, where it says that there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, and Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say it, said unto thee, Ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but thou canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. We noted first that the kingdom of God, in order to enter it, one must be born again. Now the kingdom is the church, as we pointed out this morning, even though we didn't go into detail concerning it. Thus, to enter into the church or the kingdom, this new birth must be done. The new birth, Jesus shows, consists of two elements, water and the spirit. And so this morning we noted the aspect of water, that the only thing in the New Testament really that embraces water is water baptism. And thus uh, it is that they were baptized in water. Uh, the Ethiopian eunuch went down into the water with Philip and they, he baptized him in the water. Uh, Peter commanded those at Cornelius' house to be baptized and asked those who were with him, can any man forbid water? And so it is a water baptism. Yet that baptism is a burial. That's the very idea of baptism, transliterated Greek word, meaning immerse or submerge. It is for the remission of sins or for salvation. And it is also to enter into the kingdom or the church. Acts 2 and verse 20, or 41 and 47. And we also looked at 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 13 where we are baptized into the body. The body being the church. Ephesians 1, and 23. Colossians 1 and verse 18. Since the church and the kingdom were one and the same. Matthew 16, 18 and 19. To be baptized into the body means you're being baptized into the kingdom. And thus, baptism is an essential element in that new birth process. But the other element that Jesus mentions is that of spirit. When we get to this aspect, some claim that this baptism or this spirit element is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Well, not to go into a study of the baptism of the Holy Spirit this afternoon, Suffice it to say that only the apostles received Holy Spirit baptism. It was not something that was for others. Um, Acts the first chapter in verses 4 and verse 5, when it, uh, Luke says that Jesus being assembled together with the apostles commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem. But wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, Ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. The ye there has reference to the apostles, not to others. The apostles were going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit, not other individuals. And in studying that, a good background would be uh, John chapters 14, 15, and 16. And seeing who the apostle or who were going to receive that guidance from the Spirit and His work 
especially that found in John 16, and what the Holy Spirit was going to do for the apostles in guiding them into all truth, showing them things to come, bringing their, to their remembrance all that Jesus had taught. So the Holy Spirit baptism was only for the apostles. That's not the element that Jesus is referring to here. But then the Calvinistic doctrine regarding the work of the Spirit upon the heart of the individual is oftentimes used, and that's the way in which most in the denominational world use the idea of being born of the Spirit. Just a, a few quotes that I got from websites. This first one was from Billy Graham's website. Stated, quote, To be born again is to have the Holy Spirit transform our hearts from indifference and hostility toward God to a love of God and a desire for righteousness and holiness. End quote. Well, that's the Holy Spirit doing this to an individual. What if he doesn't want it done? Have you ever thought about that? He doesn't want to change his life. But the Holy Spirit's going to change his life from indifference and hostility toward God to love of God. What if he hates God, though? Hmm. Doesn't want to love God. Well, too bad, I guess, because of their view, a uh, Calvinistic view. He doesn't have any choice in the matter. He's going to get changed no matter what he wants. Uh, that, of course, takes away any free moral agency on man's part. But they have the Holy Spirit transforming the heart. By the way, it means you can't do it yourself. You can't change from a hatred to God to a love for God. You can't do anything. That's the Calvinistic doctrine. You're totally depraved. You cannot do anything that would please God. So you can't change your heart according to that doctrine. But that doctrine is a false doctrine. That's not the work of the Spirit to change our hearts other than through what we're going to be studying along the lines of the Spirit this afternoon. Some teach that it's simply accepting Jesus there's a website called the Got Questions website, uh, used quite often by some Baptists, but um, it states, quote, Trusting in Jesus Christ, the one who paid the penalty of sin when he died upon the cross, is the means to be born again. And we noted this morning how that Saul of Tarsus, on the road to Damascus, Jesus appears to him. He asks, Who art thou, Lord? I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. What will thou have me to do, Lord? At that point in time, he's trusting Jesus, but yet we noted this morning that he was still had his sins upon him. Because Ananias would come to him and tell him to wash away his sins in that act of baptism. So this idea of... Just trusting in Jesus, that's the being born again, is a false concept. A website called Christianity says, quote, It is an experience when the teachings of Christianity and Jesus become real, and the born again acquires a personal relationship with God. They continue on. The phrase born again applies to people who have accepted Jesus as their Savior or Redeemer. Well, again, denominational concepts of just accepting Jesus. And that this is an experience. What type of an experience? You know, I hadn't done this in a while because I hadn't used hammer and nails. But when I used to use it every once in a while... You know, every once in a while I, hit, I miss that uh, nail that I was aiming for and hit another nail. That was some experience. If you've never experienced it, well, I hope you don't have to. But it's an experience. Well, is that the experience they're talking about? 
Well, this is an experience when Jesus becomes real. You mean he wasn't real before? He didn't exist before? He was in maybe uh, just a figment of people's imagination before. They, what they say doesn't make sense. They don't give any Bible either. But it's just trusting Jesus and you'll have this experience. You know, that's really the old time uh, mourner's bench religion. People over here mourning because they want to be saved and they can't be saved until they have some experience. And so when they have this experience, they come and tell their experience and then they can be voted on whether that was an experience of the Holy Spirit changing their life for them and saving them. Now, quotes like these could be multiplied many times over. But the question really is, what did the... What does the Bible teach relating to this subject? And let's begin with Titus 3 and verse 5. Because it, this new birth process does relate to salvation. It's not by works of righteousness which we have done. And when we're talking about works of righteousness which we have done does not deal with obedience to the gospel. It's a work that we have de determined on our own is going to save us. A work of righteousness which we have done. It's of our own imagination, our own teaching, our own thoughts. Not a submission to the will of God. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us. By the washing of regeneration, washing there it has a direct reference again to the act of baptism in which we have our sins washed away. Well, here's the washing of regeneration, a washing of the new birth and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Here is a, the Holy Ghost making us new. The question again comes back to how does he do it? How does he make us new? Is it just some experience in our heart that we have to get voted on as to whether or not it's the Holy Spirit working or not? Paul, in writing to his, the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians, the fourth chapter, in verse 15, he says, Though ye have... 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet ye have not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you. There's the idea of the new birth process. I have begotten you. How? Through the gospel. They were baptized, and you can go back to first chapter in relationship to their baptism. But it was through the gospel. Now then, if you go back to the second chapter, you start saying a little bit more as to what the Spirit's work is. And how that the Spirit was revealing the mind of God to the apostles, who they then spoke that word which the Holy Spirit was giving them, producing the gospel. Now then... Here's the Spirit's working through the gospel. The Spirit was using that instrument of the gospel of Jesus Christ to bring about that new birth process. And thus, they being born again or begotten through the gospel that Paul was preaching. In James 1 and verse 18, James would write that of his own will, he beget us. There's that new birth that we're discussing of his own will. That goes back to what we read in Titus 3 and verse 5. It's not by our works of righteousness, but according to His mercy He saved us. 
by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. Thus, of his own will, he beget us, how? With the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. So again, here's the Spirit using the word of God to instill within us life. In Ephesians, the fifth chapter, and in verse 26, Paul would write that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Notice both aspects now. He is going to, and the discussion here is the church, which is the kingdom, which the new birth allows us to enter. And that he might sanctify and cleanse the church. How? With the washing of water. There's the act of baptism. By the word. There's the element of the spirit. The spirit using that word of God. And so when we are baptized, we enter into that kingdom where we are sanctified and cleansed. The spirit using the word of God to do this. In 1 Peter, the first chapter, verses 22 and 23, <coughs> we could spend a couple of years going through this passage, but uh, Peter says, Seeing you purified your souls, there's a need for the purification of souls. Why? Because it's been stained with sin. How is it going to be purified? By being washed. How? In that act of baptism, Acts 22 and verse 16. Saying, ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth. The truth must be obeyed. What is the truth? Well, the truth this is the word of God. He mentions here the seed, the incorruptible seed. It is the gospel. It is the word of the Lord. Five, and going through uh, verse, the end of the chapter, verse 25, there's five things that he mentions relating to the, the New Testament. Here, truth. That we can know truth, we can obey the truth. Through the Spirit. You have obeyed that truth through the Spirit. There's the medium of that gospel. That the Spirit brought the truth into existence. The Spirit revealed to the apostles all truth. John 14, verse 25 and 26, and John 16, 12 and 13. The Spirit was revealing that truth through which they obeyed and purified their souls. They come into unto an unfeigned love of the brethren, and then the command, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. Being born again. Now notice this. In that way in which you've purified your souls and obeying the truth through the Spirit, you are being born again. Why? Because you have both elements in the act of baptism and the Spirit's work. And in that, you're being born again. But notice he goes on, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. So here, we are born again, begotten, by incorruptible seed. That incorruptible seed, again, is the Word of God. It is the gospel. It is the truth. It is the Word of the Lord. Here is the Spirit using the Word. And again, we could uh, call upon Luke 8 and verse 11. 
in that parable that Jesus gives, and he says the seed is the Word of God. So here is the Spirit. We have been begotten again through the Spirit. But how? By that incorruptible Word. The Spirit is instilling within us life. In John the 6th chapter, Jesus gives some hard teachings to His disciples. And the majority of them leave. It says in verse 66, From that time many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Jesus turns to the twelve, his own apostles, and asks them, Will you go away? Notice what Peter's response is. Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life, and we believe that and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Those words are the words of life. They give, they instill life into us. What is it? It's the words of the Spirit. Those words are the words of spirit and of life. If you go back to verse 63 then, is it any wonder that it says, It is the spirit that quickeneth the flesh, profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Now notice, the word quickeneth means to make alive. The words of the spirit make us alive. They give us spiritual life. And thus, when we go back to John the third chapter, and Jesus sets forth these two elements, water and spirit. The water is that act of baptism. But when we're dealing with spirit, what is it? It's the Spirit giving us life. How does He do it, though? He does it through the words that are given unto us, those words of the New Testament. They instill within us spiritual life. And that life comes to fruition when we are baptized in water for the forgiveness of our sins. And thus we must be begotten of the Spirit, or by the Spirit, which is effected by the Word of God. That penitent faith that has been generated by the Gospel. Remember, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Thus, that faith that is generated by the Gospel will lead one to obey the New Testament command to be baptized in water. And those who do so enter into and become citizens of that kingdom of God. That's being born again. Cannot happen any other way. But let's notice also 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter. And in 1 Corinthians 12, let me get back to it. Paul sets forth that principle. in which uh, that by one spirit are we all baptized into 
one body. The question is relating to for by one spirit. Is that spirit, of course many individuals will come along and teach that the spirit there is the spirit baptism, going back to what we mentioned previously. The question really becomes, is spirit in this passage agency or element? Are we being baptized into the element of the spirit? Or are we being baptized by the agency of the spirit? Now then, not to get into a real detailed discussion, it is by the agency of the Spirit. Thus, as we've seen, by the Word of God. Spirit using the agency of the Word of God. We are baptized, water baptized, to enter into that kingdom that harmonizes totally with what we have taught in all of these passages. And that harmonizes with the totality of the Bible's teaching. That to enter the kingdom, to enter the church, which we mentioned this morning, it takes water baptism as instructed by the Spirit. The Spirit using the Word of God to instill in us faith to produce life within us, we are then baptized into that body, that church, that kingdom. And as we mentioned this morning in Acts the second chapter, they who gladly received the word were baptized and there were added 3,000 souls. They were added, we find in verse 47, to the church. They were added to that kingdom. Why? Because Paul and go back or Peter on this occasion went through and he instilled faith within those in Jews. So much so that they were pricked in their hearts and they cried out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter tells them what to do, as instructed again by the Spirit guiding him into all truth, bringing to his remembrance all things that Jesus had taught. And he tells them, you need to repent, you need to be baptized for the remission of your sins. They who did that, what happened to them? They were added to the church. Why? Because they had gone through that new birth process to enter into the kingdom of God. In Acts the 8th chapter, we mentioned this this morning that Philip goes to Samaria. And in verse 5, he preaches Jesus unto them. In the, or preaching Christ unto them. In the preaching of Christ, we find that when we come to verse 12, that those who believed Philip's preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. So in the preaching of Christ, he preached the kingdom. That, in order to get into, you have to go through that new birth. What happened? Well, by the way, notice there had to be a preaching of the kingdom, which is the church, before they were baptized. They had to have an understanding of certain things dealing with the church in order to be scripturally baptized but also the name of Jesus Christ. When you deal with the name of Christ, you're dealing with His authority. Philip was teaching them, here's the authority of Christ. Now he was being guided by the Holy Spirit in what he taught. What happened? Because of that which they now believed, because of the Word of God, What happened? They were baptized. 
Why? Because that's the Spirit's instruction. And the Spirit was instilling within them life and knew that they needed to be baptized in water for the forgiveness of their sins so that they could enter into the church, they could go through that new birth process and enter into the kingdom. But also, when we're dealing with a new birth, you have a child. You're dealing with the birth of a child. That's what you're dealing with. In 1 John John 3, verses 1 and verse 2, John would write, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the children of God, or the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We have become sons of God, the children of God. But how? Through the new birth. We could just simply say that and leave it at that. The new birth produces a child, a son of God now. But let's find out how. When we turn over to Galatians, the third chapter, we find out the answer to that question. In verse 26 and 27, For ye are all children of God. There's the same thing as being the Son of God. By faith. Literally, by faith there is by the faith. He's dealing with the Word of God. The Word of God makes an makes us a child of God. Why? Because the Holy Spirit using the Word of God and instilling faith within us, giving us life. But then he goes on in verse 27, for, and the word for there is a little Greek word that's, the Greek word is gar. And as found here, it's being stated Here is the way in which you became a child of God. That's the emphasis of this Greek word gar in this passage. The way in which you became a child of God, as many of you as have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. That's how you became a child of God, through the faith. God's word and thus baptism being joined together to, be, to produce a child of God. What is it? To go through that new birth process which produces a child. And not a physical child, but a spiritual child, thus a child of God. To be a new creature. You know, when one is born, we have a new baby, a new creature. Yet in Paul in 2 Corinthians 5 in verse 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. But how do we get into Christ? Well, Romans 6 verse 3 and verse 4 tell us, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Notice, uh, we are baptized into Christ. But notice, if you will, go down a few verses here in Romans 6. And... We come to verse 17 and 18, where he says, But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. Notice, here is a doctrine that had been taught to them. What is it? That's the Word of God being taught. Again, chapter 10 and verse 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. An obedience to the truth 
Well, notice you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine. It cannot be just going through the motions, in other words. Our heart has to be changed. How is it changed? It's changed by the Word of God. The Holy Spirit, yes, is acting upon our hearts, but He's acting upon our hearts not directly, but He's using the Word of God to affect our heart. so that when we obey from the heart that truth in being baptized, because we have been delivered that doctrine, that teaching from God, we go through that new birth process. And then one more thing, and the lesson will be yours. This new birth process places us within a family. It's the family of God. In Ephesians 2, verse 19 and 20, Now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints, and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the, the chief corner, our chief cornerstone. Here is the household of God. Now what? It's built upon the foundation. There's a foundation that's there. What is that foundation? It's the Word that has been taught to us. And thus that we believe and we obey. In Titus, or 1 Timothy 3 and verse 15, thus... Paul would say that if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Here's the truth, that pillar and ground of what the church. What is the church? He refers to it as the house of God. To get into that house of God, that church of God, the house of God, the family of God, to become a child of God, to go through that new birth process, there must be that proper teaching. The Word of God instilling faith within us, that Word of God which was given by the Spirit to the apostles, they wrote it down for us so that when we read, we can have their understanding of the mystery of Christ. Ephesians 4, or 3, verses 1 through 5. And that Word of God teaching us to be baptized in water for the forgiveness of our sins. And when we do that, that's being born again. That's that new birth process that allows us to enter into the church, the kingdom of God. If you've not been born again, born of water and of the Spirit, baptized in water as directed by the Spirit, as He begets us by the Word of truth, the Word of God. And we would encourage you to obey that gospel this afternoon. Let us baptize you in water as directed by the instructions of the Spirit because of your faith that you have in Christ, that proper teaching that has produced faith. Repenting of your sins, a change of your heart, yes. That you have decided now you're going to follow Jesus. You're going to do what God said. You're going to forsake evil. You're going to make things right within your life. Then being baptized in water to enter into that family of God, the kingdom of God. You need to come this afternoon. We encourage you to come as we stand and sing the invitation song.